So welcome back. We are starting our fourth panel for the day titled Frontiers and Their Politics of Planning. My name is Qian Go, and I'm an, an assistant professor of urban planning at UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. And I just have to say to begin that I am honored and thrilled to be part of these conversations. It's been a remarkable day to say the least. And so thank you to Professor Hibabu Akar, Dean Amal Andraus, and the whole team at Columbia GSAP for putting this together and enabling these conversations to take place. So I'll say a quick note about the panel itself and then introduce our five speakers, uh, and then they will present in turn. So this panel is about frontiers in planning. Frontiers as an idea of territorial and sociopolitical and socioecological conflict and transformations. Frontiers in knowledge production and co-production. Frontiers in ideas about the future. So a really simple, well, not so simple question. How might our understanding of frontiers help us sift through the stakes and potentialities of planning research and practice? We will hear from five Sterling scholars for this panel. First, Catherine Rankin is Professor of Geography and Urban Planning at the University of Toronto. Her research interests include gender and development, comparative market regulation, financial restructuring, planning history and theory, generally from research in South Asia. She is currently undertaking research in the areas of commercial gentrification, neighborhood-based community economic development, excuse me, and post-conflict transition. Second, Nima Kudva is an associate professor of city and regional planning at Cornell University where she is also Associate Dean of the Faculty, a faculty affiliate of the South Asia Program, and a fellow of the Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future. Her research focuses on small cities in their regions and on institutional structures for equitable planning and development. Malini Ranganathan is an Associate Professor at the School of International Service at American University, where she serves as the interim faculty director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center. An urban geographer by training, her scholarship focuses on urban environmental justice in India and the United States, drawing on history, ethnography, and critical mapping to study water and sanitation, land and housing, and flooding and climate change vulnerability. Bjorn Sleto is an associate professor of community and regional planning at the University of Texas at Austin. His research focuses on indigenous land rights, environmental and social justice, and on and alternative planning approaches in the United States and Latin America. He is particularly interested in the dichotomies and tensions between local knowledge and traditional environmental management systems and formal planning and management approaches. And then to end, Cheryl Ann Simpson is an associate, excuse me, Cheryl Ann Simpson is an assistant professor of geography and environmental studies at Carleton University. Her research and teaching are informed by an interest in the ways in which states and communities interact in place. Her work is focused on questions around citizenship and immigration, environmental justice, and urban health, and it reflects her interdisciplinary training centered around social planning and community development with stops in political science, biology, and geography. So we will begin with Professor Catherine Rankin, please. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, Kian, and thank you, Hiba and Laila for organizing and, and really for putting me on a panel with such valued colleagues. Um, I wanna thank the panelists who have come before, who've been so inspiring and challenging, and also the participants who've endured uh, what I hope for you is the longest Zoom day ever. Um, and also I want to say hello to so many friends. So 
I've decided to do something a bit risky in relation to the frontiers of accumulation and disp dispossession and frontiers of political transformation in planning. And that is to talk about my home institution of 20, more than 20 years now, the University of Toronto. And I, I thought I'd start by recalling um, in relation to the panel description, which mentions critical development studies, although I don't think you did, Kian, um, that about a decade ago, I wrote a series of articles looking at the praxis of planning in relation to critical development studies, right? And um, the professional practices that both critical development studies and planning theory take as their object of study of course, you know, share a duplicitous, duplicitous relationship to processes of capitalist accumulation and liberal notions of benevolent trusteeship. But critical development studies, I argued then, had done a better job of tracing the entanglements of projects of improvement with projects of empire. And I, and I suggested that when such theorizations about development are brought to bear on the more subtle, I thought, object of urban planning, then there too the flagrancies of uh, what Ananya Roy is called liberal benevolence could be exposed and challenged. And I guess I saw um, critical development studies then as a kind of a frontier that could push planning to challenge more forcefully the ongoing violences at the interface of capitalism and colonialism to seek out agents of revolutionary social change and to catalyze collective critical consciousness among those engaged in kind of individual subversive practice. Um, and so I wanted to basically start by saying, I'm feeling less optimistic these days about critical development studies as an epistemological frontier. I'm sure I'm not alone in that assessment. Um, and I wanted to tie it to how they, critical development studies, have been institutionalized at U of T along with the related tradition of area studies before turning to what I see as the institutionalized opportunities for articulating just planning futures in planning education to pick up on a thread that Delia, Delia um, initiated in the last panel. So critical development studies at U of T manifests as a, as a transdisciplinary seminar series to, some of, to which some of you have been invited um, that seeks to explore development as a location for investigating uneven global power relations. Um, it's where I catch up with friends um, from other departments like Tanya Lee, Tambela Kepe, Nyung Tran, Ritu Birla, who many of you know. Um, and crucially, we are all trained in area studies, right? And we have a similar take on the merits of contextualized knowledges, right? Of histories, languages, cultures, as standpoints for interpreting the world, right? A point that was just underscored by um, both Vanessa Watson and Libby Porter. So resonant with the, um, some of the findings of a recent Global Planning Educators Interest Group or GPIG report, um, which argues against planning programs having international development specializations, right? Some of us have been troubled by the push at our university for fast policy fed by fast knowledge, fast policy about the world, the globalization usually. So our skepticism about the role of the university in producing knowledge about globalization has also been fueled by institutionalized processes like the trajectory beginning with the renaming and absorbing of our old Center for International Studies, which used to house area studies and development studies into the Monk School of Global Affairs. And that is Monk, as in Peter Monk, the founder and CEO of Barrick Gold, uh, which is the world's largest 
Gold Mining Corporation. And that last year transmuted further into the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. So at the same time, um, as these institutionalized changes have been going on, we've been growing increasingly curious about the possibilities for worlding the university, university to borrow from Ananya's formulation. So meaning wanting to recognize the merits of delving deeply into the histories and cultures of particular regions as we've always done, while also recognizing the imperative of post-colonial and decolonial scholarship, indicating that more inclusive and accountable modes of knowledge production are needed. So we took up the possibility of developing an initiative that would expand the constituency for development studies and area studies while also contesting the tilt toward fast policy by calling for a worlding practice at U of T, right? That would promote depth and relational, relationality, um, that would decolonize knowledge and center difference so that the mantra nothing about us without us is a guiding theme, right? And again, a nod to Vanessa's conclusions about centering knowledge about Africa in Africa. And, um, and Libby's also on learning with, with philosophy that comes from this place. Um, and the third aspect of uh, worlding U of T would be to rethink transition narratives, right? So, so much noting right, that so much research and policymaking remains anchored in stubbornly linear assumptions about the way the world is headed from country to city, from farm to factory, and that these are transition narratives that reproduce negative framings right, of underdevelopment, failed states, informal economies, and so on. So worlding requires, on the contrary, identifying and communicating heterogeneous processes. Okay, so the possibilities at U of T for this kind of worlding project are enormous as they likely are at many of your institutions. Thick area studies programs cross cut by traditional humanities and social sciences departments and other centers for critical knowledge like um, diaspora and transnational studies, the school of cities, a humanities institute and so on. And yet the challenges proved formidable. Um, so our huge capacity on the conceptual front sit in tension as I sh I'm sure they do in your institutions with the uneven scattering of these capacities across differently resourced units on three campuses. Some units are well resourced and command significant geographical and political space within the university, Asian studies, the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies, as it happens. Others operate on a shoestring and out of veritable broom closets, uh, African studies, Caribbean studies. So instead of meaningful self-study about the dynamics of racism in these institutional configurations and processes, we end up with little bits of turf that have to be defended and an administrative leadership oriented to suppressing rather than collaboratively exploring dissent, contradiction and systemic inequality, inequity. So for example, plans for a round table dialogue on decolon decolonizing the university and treaty responsibilities intended to explore what it means to live and work on treaty lands and what opportunities we have as staff students and faculty to meet our ongoing treaty responsibilities had to be postponed because of perceived erasures of slavery and black people's presence in Canada implied in the characterization of U of T as a community of indigenous and settler scholars. Meanwhile, racism persists within the mundane workings of traditional social science and humanities departments. Um, so a Southeast Asian colleague in a social science department is addressed in department forums only as a specialist in area studies with no regard to her for her contributions to theory. 
Another Asian colleague in the humanities department is asked to cover courses on Africa because of the department's lack of capacity in that area on the presumption that her expertise in Asia would qualify her sufficiently to address another global South geography. So the politics of critical development studies and area studies, it seems are too fraught with the, a toxic combination of white supremacy, multiple racisms and a fractured unevenly resourced institutional landscape to engage generatively at this juncture in worlding practices. And so I wanted to shift to say by contrast, uh, our relatively little corner of planning within a department of geography and planning, as it turns out, has proven a bit more fertile for exploring frontiers and imagining futures of political transformation this year at least. Um, like many others in our planning, um, like many other planning programs, ours is currently conducting a wide ranging internal review, including issues concerning curriculum, recruitment, community relations. And the review coincides with organizing by students who urged us to address anti-Black racism and other forms of injustice in our programs and beyond in the wake of the recent waves of police, police violence against Black and Indigenous peoples and the historic political mobilizations of, of um, Black and Indigenous movements. And more, more generally, the review is premised on a recognition that official planning practices in Toronto transpire on colonial lands and contribute to well-documented processes of racialized spatial inequality. So under such circumstances, we've sought to raise the question, how must critical planning educators respond to, the, to today's urgent yet contested demands for social justice? So I thought I'd ask myself uh, for our purposes here today, what are some of the features of our process of program review that make me optimistic about this juncture for planning futures? What are the conditions of possibility that I see aligning right now within planning education as we know it? Um, I, I fear that my responses might seem um, trivial, but I, I do think that they add up to um, something important. Um, so I'd say that first, we've hired a, a Black professional planner, uh, Abigail Mariah, and uh, who's an alumna of our program and founder of two nonprofit organizations, the Black Planning Project and the Mentorship Initiative for Indigenous and Planners of Color, to collaborate in our review. Uh, which is not a conventional arrangement for a review of academic program. We've also hired not just student RAs to support research, but also student members of the planning review committee through a competitive application process, right? So on the basis of their knowledge of or experience with anti-Black and other racisms. So that student's job is to attend review committee meetings as members and contribute their perspectives on the materials circulated for discussion. This arrangement too was complicated to get institutional approval for, as you can imagine, because of the risks of the ever present or frequently uttered risks of precedent setting. Um, but I'm proud that my department did in the end consent and together these processes, these kind of configurations of our committee for the review have really allowed us to examine in practical material ways, the nexus of knowledge, power and practice. So second, um, two of our internal review committee members, myself and um, a brilliant master's student named Keisha St. Louis McBurney were invited to sit on an anti-Black racism task force struck by the Ontario Planners, Ontario Professional, Professional Planners Institute. So OPPI is not exactly a site I would have imagined as a frontier for planning futures, having long regarded it as a conservative guild fundamentally beholden to the workings of racial capitalism and its manifestation in private real estate. 
But I've been compelled by OPPI's process of assembling practitioners, students, and faculty to find common ground in naming structures of racialized accumulation and dispossession, while also in a more resurgent vein, exploring together um, how to remove barriers to becoming a professional planner in order to address the lack of black representation in the profession. Yes, you're right, a necessary but not sufficient politics of presence. Um, how to build and share knowledge about black histories and histories of systemic anti-black racism in the planning education of everyone and how to promote a more informed planning practice that recognizes diverse publics um, baselines of urban life to use Abdul Malik's formulation and how to better engage with black communities to address issues arising from their lived experiences. So when I heard Mona and um, Abdul Malik talking about building public institutions capable of taking care of things this morning, I felt actually so grateful, right, to have a new generation of OPPI practitioners as colleagues with whom to de deliberate the politics of inclusion and incorporation in relation to structures of accumulation and dispossession. And then I'll just end on um, third that this is really, and this is really where I take to heart the injunctions of critical race and feminist theories to trouble our institutional and epistemological homes. We, and I, I mean um, faculty and students in the planning program of U, at U of T, have agreed that addressing anti-Black racism in planning education must begin with self-study. We've relied on the critical skills and sensibilities of research assistants Kuni Kamazaki and Hazel Valenzuela, Valenzuela with some consultation as well with Faranak, who's been involved in similar processes at U, UICU, um, to develop visual uh, representations of our curricula and our courses and how they have changed over time. So shared platforms of knowledge in Mona's words this morning and to develop processes for collective review of individual syllabi. If I'm sound, starting to sound self-congratulatory, um, let me tell you that what we found is not to be celebrated. Okay, so core faculty abandoning pedagogic missions of the program to focus on more current research interests the persistence of a hegemonic canon despite attempts to introduce alternative canons at the margin, inconsist inconsistent attention to questions of knowledge, power, and action in our most skills-oriented courses, the persistence of the, mo the most egregious colonial models of development in some of our courses oriented to planning law and project management, and the um, evidence that anti-Black racism is too often treated as an afterthought in our courses. So all this is um, in a department comprised of dear trusted colleagues with whom I enjoy um, an apparently misguided image of our program as situated at the cutting edge of radicalism in planning. And I suppose what I find uh, most promising about this prospect process goes back to what you all already know about collaborative modes of knowledge production informed by critical theory. In the rarefied context of North American academia, that translates into the somewhat unusual situation of faculty agreeing to some form of group censorship, whereby claims for academic freedom can give way to a collective accountability to essential mission oriented to planning education for social justice. So I'll just conclude by underscoring that um, the imperative for a material foundation for anti-Black racism um, must you know, be centered, right? Before worlding projects can um, advance within universities, that's first point. And second, um, I just argue that we can find frontiers for political transformation in our own planning education backyards, that alternative futures do not necessarily have to, to entail grand constructions, but it can, can include modest self um, study with the aim of repair. And that once we get clear about some basic common ground, then possibilities for collaboration with unlikely partners opens up. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Catherine. Malini Ranganathan. 
Thank you so much to um, my dear friend Hiba and to Lila for pulling off this meeting of minds. Um, I'm so grateful to have been included. Thank you to the 20 panelists and moderators who have made this such a worthwhile event. And thank you especially to the audience. Um, if this is not your first panel today and you stuck through it, then I can't see you, but I love you. So thank you. In today's comments, which I have titled Frontier Lawfare and Environmental Unfreedoms, I want to look at the interplay between particular forms of legal power and um, the making of environmental unfreedoms in and through the frontier. So like the panelists before me, um, I will explore the frontier in theory and in history in terms of its real um, material stakes, but also um, the frontier as offering unfettered conceptual possibilities. And here I'm particularly interested in emancipatory urban political ecologies. So a few years ago, um, I was invited to write an essay which I titled The Environment as Freedom Towards a Decolonial Reimagining. Um, and in this essay, I sought to reclaim the analytic of freedom for environmental justice struggles. Whether it is lead poisoning coursing through a young person's body or lungs strangulated by surface ozone in a neighborhood ripped through by a highway, or the sulfurous stench embedded in hair and on skin due to dehumanizing sanitation labor, I use the concept of environmental unfreedoms to signify the fundamentally humanity and dignity robbing qualities of environmental injustice. Now the shift from environmental injustices to environmental unfreedoms is tactical and semantic. It forces a move away from the liberal legalism that frames US centric scholarship on distributive and procedural justice. The environment as freedom is at core a rehumanizing and life affirming trope. It is a political demand to interrupt the production of state sanctioned or extra legal group differentiated vulnerabilities to premature death, to use Ruthie Gilmore's canonical phrasing. My use of the word freedoms and unfreedoms also calls attention to how Dalit, referring to untouchable laboring castes, which I'll get into today, and black literatures alike, diasporic and internationalist black literatures, name myriad social and ecological indignities precisely through the dialectics of freedom and unfreedom. And the frontier that I'm going to be pushing today is the under recognition, indeed silence of caste in critical urban studies and the need to reinstate it as a, as a very key analytic, especially in the intersections between environmental unfreedoms and state power. So I'm going to bring environmental unfreedoms into conversation with what I'm going to be calling frontier lawfare. Writing about how legal procedure and the discourse of law and order are marshaled for violent and predatory state projects in the post colony, Jean and Jean Komarov propose the term lawfare as they define it using the case of Zimbabwe's brutal slum evictions during the Mugabe regime of the early 2000s, lawfare is quote, the resort to legal instruments, to the violence inherent in the law, to commit acts of political coercion, even erasure. More concisely, lawfare is where the legal and the lethal animate and, and, and inhabit each other. Crucially for the Komaros, lawfare is not simply the exercise of violence through and justified by the law. It is also the exaggerated spectacle and enactment of the law the courts, the barristers in colonial garb, the language of writ petitions and affidavits. Frontiers with their unstable hybridities, temporalities and open-endedness, as so many of the esteemed panelists today have written about, Abdul Malik, Ananya, Hiba, Teresa and others are both the conditions of possibility and the outcomes of lawfare. As opposed to the presumed statelessness of frontiers, as Tio Balve's work on Colombia has shown, frontiers give rise to the most creative and violent expressions of state power. From the outset, frontier lawfare has always been justified and legitimized 
in the name of some public purpose. This is no less true of present day urban frontiers as it was of colonial frontiers. In 1893, Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis argued that the, that the conflict between civilizing European settlers and sa savage natives occurred at quote, the hither edge of free land and had the purpose of forming America as an independent free people and a democratic nation. Now Turner's repeated invocation of freedom and free land in his frontier thesis serves as a ruse, the misuse of freedom, if you will, for what was in fact the violent extermination, erasure and plunder made possible by settler colonial frontier lawfare. To illustrate frontier lawfare's relationship with environmental unfreedoms, that is my contribution to today's theme, I want to now turn to a story from Bangalore in Southern India, where I've been conducting ethnographic and collaborative research with an anti-caste collective. In 2018, I partnered with Slam Jagatu, a Dalit investigative journalism collective based in Bangalore. Slam Jagatu, meaning slum world, is led by a left Dalit journalist come activist, Isaac Arul Selva, pictured here in his 2020 op-ed, What Have We Built for the People Who Build Our Cities? He WhatsApped me this op-ed during the pandemic. My work with him and Slam Jagatu involves archiving and translating forgotten and erased histories of land water ecologies in Bengaluru, as well as tracing new idioms of international solidarity from a Dalit and anti-caste epistemology. For those who may not be familiar, since I know this is a very international audience, the term Dalit was assigned by the Maharashtrian abolitionist Jyoti Rao Phule in the late 1800s, who dedicated his book, Gulamgiri, meaning slavery, to quote, the good people of the United States in the cause of Negro slavery. But this book is not about slavery in the US. It is about slaves in India, who Phule seeks to emancipate from quote, the trammels of Brahmin thraldom, Brahmin being the name given to the most dominant landholding castes. Dalit translates to broken person, roughly speaking in, Mar in Marathi. Dalits have long provided the unfree labor, the backbone of colonial and capitalist economics, serving as bonded or unfree labor in agriculture, manual scavengers, construction laborers, meat skinners, and sanitation workers. Earlier today, Oren Yiftekel used the word essentialization to refer to the dehumanized laborers of Dubai. This word is key in the anti-caste literature as well. In fact, Dalits are essentialized and even racialized as polluted and criminal, relegated to the work in society that nobody else will do. Officially, Dalits fall within a census category called scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, which accounts for about 25% of India's population. But the word Dalit is political, not bureaucratic. It was claimed by anti-caste movements during the first half of the 20th century, much like the term black was claimed as a liberatory identity at the same time. I'm extremely interested in Dalit Black solidarities as seen in Slam Jagatu's work. I hasten to add here that while scholars are busy thinking about whether decolonial is an appropriate use for things they're observing in the world, there are several of these connections that are already underway, not necessarily through the idiom of decolonization, but through perhaps more basic idioms such as freedom. So pictured on the left is Slam Jagatu's April 2018 newsletter commemorating Ambedkar Jayanti or the birthday of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, India's foremost Dalit civil rights activist and author of the constitution. Now inside this 2018 issue is a story of Marielle Franco, the Afro-Brazilian queer feminist and socialist who organized for favela rights at the urban periphery and was murdered in extrajudicial cold blood just the month before in March, 2018 it turns out by two former police officers, exactly what her political activism sought to call attention to. I love putting these two pictures side by side because it looks as if they are looking at each other in a kind of workers of the world unite moment. This is the South-South cooperation that does not often show up in hegemonic planning radars. These transnational solidarities are neither coincidental nor random. When Ambedkar wrote to Du Bois in 1946, asking him to share the National Alliance for the Advancement of Colored People's petition to the UN, the NAACP, he, inter he introduced himself as, quote, a student of the Negro problem, 
working in the cause of, quote, securing liberty to the oppressed people. With this gesture, Ambedkar laid the groundwork for Dalit Black Solidarities, later witnessed in the Dalit Liberation Party, the Dalit Panthers naming itself after the Black Panthers in the 1970s. So I bring these two cases up because often when we think about the referent for Blackness, we think about North America, um, especially in terms of anti-colonial um, struggles um, for academics that are situated within North America. But it's particularly important to see that Black diasporic struggles have also been key reference. So both you know, located in Brazil, as well as of course the United States for some of the, um, the types of activism and grassroots formations that we see in global South cities. So returning to the contemporary moment, one of Slum Jagatu's most high profile battles involved the eviction of 5,000 Dalits in 2013, most of whom were sanitation laborers from a slum called Yejipura to make way for malls and apartment buildings, as well as a resettlement housing colony for economically weaker sections or EWS at the peri-urban frontier. Slum Jagatu refers to this eviction as a blatant case of casteist land grab in which the city is being recreated as the traditional village with upper caste living in the center and untouchables or Dalits living on the far frontiers or fringes. So while we talk about how the village is being urbanized. This is actually the ruralization of the urban in terms of traditional strictures as seen from Dalit standpoint epistemology. The legal status of the land in question is complex and has not been doc documented, but for Slam Jagatu's work. Over 50 years, the land in question outlined here on this map in green has passed from a village commons to a officially designated slum to a public-private partnership in the 2000s with the real estate developer Maverick Holdings Private Limited, the CEO, CEO of whom is Uday Garudachar, a politician of the Hindu nationalist BJP party. The partnership was negotiated at one of the state's famed global investor meets in the early 2000s. As cities rapidly transform through fast-tracked capitalist political economy, who tells the story of their erased land water ecologies, asks historian Devjani Bhattacharya writing on Kolkata. When I visited the site in February, 2018, I snapped this jarring picture. In the background is the fence guarding the property with the sign PPP project of BBMP, the Bangalore government, Maverick Holdings Private Limited, Bangalore. In the foreground is an image of Ambedkar in his iconic blue suit plastered on a tin shed. The retroactive designation of the area from a recognized slum to an encroachment brings to mind Gautam Ban's work on public interest law in Delhi, which uses the figure of the encroacher to dehumanize personhood. Here now is the expelled Dalit, expelled through lawfare at the frontier, now inhabiting the margins of this private property. In terms of environmental unfreedoms, they are multiple and inter intersectional across land, labor, ecology. For those lucky enough to get resettlement housing, they currently lack water, sanitation, and transit networks at the far frontiers of the city. Um, and they face additional risks of dengue fever in a poorly drained environment. For those who could uh, not prove long-term residency, they were reduced to pavement dwelling near the eviction site. According to a doctor who had been caring for the evicted, women in particular are suffering from sexual violence and a lack of healthcare, even as they continue to face criminalization and stigma. Bombay-based photographer Javed Iqbal captured the violence of that eviction that day through a series of photographs titled The Afterlives of Structural Violence. What I really appreciate about Iqbal's collection is that, he, is that he focuses not gratuitously on the violence of that day, the strewn belongings, the detritus of crushed buildings, the anguish and desperation of the evictees, but he captures the heavily policed nature of the incident. So in this photograph, you can see the kind of artillery um, that is on top of the police truck, um, which looks like a combination of um, water blasters as well as video cameras that is meant to control um, riots. Um, and in the foreground, of course, you see uh, male police officers and, and with their very large mustachioed faces and mustaches are, are very preeminent symbols of, of South Indian masculinity. But there were also female police officers deployed that day. And it turns out that by capturing the presence of police, this turned out to be a very important um, um, 
demonstration of the practice of lawfare that day. The police treated us like criminals and denied us food, water, and medicine, said Manjula, a Dalit woman evicted that day, in a fact-finding mission by the Housing and Land Rights Network. They talk about laws. When we don't follow traffic rules, they impose a fine on us. If that is the case, why is the law not applied when we as citizens are being thrown out in the streets? They are chasing us like thieves, added Shanta. As the political ecologist Yafa Trulove has argued, environmental harms have gone hand in hand with the criminalization of personhood to serve certain state agendas. Given the larger context of right-wing Hindutva nationalism, which have criminalized and lynched beef-eating Dalits and Muslims, state agendas suture together planning with ethno-nationalism to produce dispossession and environmental unfreedoms. But there's a really important recursive aspect to this relationship too. Environmental concerns and logics such as flooding and climate resilience are often in turn stitched together with lawfare and planning procedures to produce further cr criminalization and environmental unfreedoms. So I'd like to conclude with a quote from abolitionist Mariam Kaba, who says, quote, we live not just in the era of mass incarceration, but also of mass criminalization. This sentiment comes from Kaba's organizing against the prison industrial complex and efforts to undo the criminalization of black women, trans and youth populations. While Kaba's work is rooted in the United States, we need to reckon with the fact that what I have referred to here as frontier lawfare and the criminalization and unfreedoms, whether social or ecological, are global phenomena. In my work on abolitionist climate justice in Washington, DC, I have similarly sought to show the concurrence of over-policing, toxicity, and climate risk in landscapes gutted by segregation, renewal, the war on drugs, evictions, and austerity, frontier lawfare, American style. So I'll end by posing three provocations, since that is the word of the day, um, to, to the, the panel and the audience. The first is, how is planning complicit in frontier lawfare? And I think we've been answering this all day. Um, and in fact, um, the work of critical planning is to, is to answer this. The second, and this is the, 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 the provocation I, I pose in conceptual terms, um, a frontier in urban theory, if you will, how can caste sharpen critical urban analyses of land, labor, and environmental freedoms, and in particular in caste's contrapuntal relationship with race? Third, what would a decolonized relationship between frontier and freedom look like? Thank you. Thank you, Malini. Next up, we have Bjorn Sleto. Bjorn. Thank you so much, Kian, and, and uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to, uh, to be here, and thank you so much for your invitation. Uh, Lila and, and Hiba, this has been this has been a really great uh, great um, gathering, and I wish I had had more opportunity to participate today. It's been uh, been a particularly difficult day with uh, with um, some uh, distractions, and um, I look forward to seeing all the recordings. And hello to friends and colleagues, and it's great to be in the same panel as, as very esteemed authors whose work I have long admired. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen um, and, uh, and get started. I was very intrigued by, by Hibas' uh, invitation to think about the frontier and because um, the kind of work I do is, is very much about uh, border crossings in, in the epistemological and ontological ways, right? And, and often I work in areas that are Commonly considered to be on the margins, to be on the uh, on the edges of, uh, of the, the modern and formal cities. So I was very interested in in thinking through this theme, and I I started to think about it as again the first thought that comes to mind, of course, is the is the epistemological element of, of the frontier as a, as a as a means of thinking through co-production. Um, which has been a central theme today and is central to what I do. Um, but I think what I wanna do is talk about three other ways of thinking about the frontier, metaphorically, to see if I can get to a new way of thinking about co-production 
um, for, for myself. And, and of course, the, the first thing that comes to mind is the thinking about the frontier as a margin, right? So we, we are, I'm often told that I'm working in a marginalized community and as places on the edge, the margin as the outer boundaries are the edge. And of course that brings to mind the structural context of the places where, where many of us work, the so-called so marginalized communities are discursively and materially maintained on the edge or pushed to the edge. So, so from, from this we are reading the concept of the, of the frontier, then it becomes a space of violence, of invasion, dispossession, neglect, and containment. But I would like to think about this a little, a little differently because this way of thinking about the frontier is as the margin feeds into uh, the planning and development ed agenda and serves to rationalize interventionist planning in urban development because the production of the margin is also the production of the center and the normalization of the center. And of course, in, uh, in my own position um, as within the center at the institution like the University of Texas, I need to be very cognizant of my own embodiment in this kind of work that I do. So what I like to do is, is think about the frontier materially. So I'm thinking about how the epistemological and ontological border crossings that you're engaged with when you do co-productive work are situated, are situated in material landscapes and symbolic landscapes. So I, I thinking it's important and worthwhile to think about how co-productions are situated in uh, frontiers that are indeed grounded in places, in materiality, in lived practices, and are shaped by the meanings that are given to such places and things. So I, I refer to this as the fencing of the, of the frontier, to, to capture this materiality of the frontier in terms of, the, of enclosure and rejection, but also the ways in which fences can indeed be declined, that can be crossed, right? So the third theme then would be to think of the frontier as a, a metaphorically as um, through planning, thinking of a plan, planning as a critical pedagogy, right? Conceptual and the frontier as a space of imagination. And um, it's a, that makes me think of the frontier as a borderland, right? It's a borderland that's constituted both through material practices, that we are all engaged in, 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 this, in these frontiers, but also through the structural relations that produce the frontier. And what I'm hoping to do is to center um, knowledge production within these borderlines, within these borderlands, and thinking about epistemological crossings in ways that are reflexive and self-aware and are situated in these social and material relations in place and to think through how this might constitute the source of a radical action. So in the few minutes that I have today, I, I wanna bring you to two sites, uh, two frontiers, as it were, where I've been working over the years. Um, first, uh, Venezuela, where I've been, um, not gonna be able to go into great depth here, but I'd like to talk about the materiality of space in indigenous communities. And of course, how these have been fenced in and circumscribed and by, by, front, by boundaries that are violently enforced, but in, then how these boundaries are also being reconceptualized and interpreted and maybe transformed into, into radical possibilities of action. In the case of the Dominican Republic, uh, I'm be talking about a community that is uh, named Los Fatanitos, that is materially and discursively marginalized and has been it's constructed as a, an urban frontier and uh, therefore it becomes this space of the planning dreams, right? But it's also a place where residents engage in co-productions in these epistemological borderlands and in ways that might point toward possibilities for radical action. So I'll jump to the Venezuela uh, story very briefly and uh, ref uh, about border boundaries of containment here. So I'm working in an um, area in Eastern Venezuela, uh, in the Pemón territory in Gran Sabana, and in the Yucca territory in Mesera de Perija. 
And as you can see, these are indeed located on the, on the political frontiers as well as symbolically within the, uh, the natural resource frontier of Venezuela. And these are communities in the, in the Gran Sabana. There are many of them very isolated, some of which are, are more, quote, developed and are located on highways. Uh, it's a landscape that, are, that is produced through crossings, uh, through uh, the mobilities of the Pemon. And in the Periha, it's a landscape of, of uh, rugged mountains that is sim simultaneously is, is constructed as the, as the land of Yucca. And it's a metaphorical borderland that is also material in the sense that the Yucca were um, formerly based in the lowlands around Lake, uh, Lake Maracaibo and have been pushed violently to, to this periphery. And um, what's happening now is that these uh, people that you find these remote, more remote communities are indeed crossing the fences. They're actually uh, reclaiming uh, land on the ranches that are in the, located in the lowlands. They're crossing the metaphorical and material fences and, and producing an indigenous speciality in these areas. So it's a very fraught, fraught space and contested space. I was invited to these to participate in mapping projects, participate in mapping projects in these two places uh, over the years. And um, there's a lot to be said about the way in which participatory mapping is done. That's, that's sort of beyond the, the scope of the talk today, but um, these are projects driven by, by indigenous communities to uh, develop uh, maps to comply with indigenous, uh, uh, with indigenous law, with, the, with the, the regulations for achieving indigenous territoriality. So it's a, it consists of a number of, of mapping workshops in, in a number of communities um, and producing maps that take many different forms, uh, such as this in, in uh, Raitepui in the Gran Sabana, and this is Kumarakapai in the Gran Sabana. And resulting in maps that comply with the uh, with interest of Pimon and Yukpa and with the state uh, uh, priorities and, and regulations as well. So I'm not gonna go into that in great detail, but I wanted to share a, a few comments that were made uh, during these mapping projects to sort of, uh, to, to try to tease out some of the, uh, the forms of co-production that happens in these epistemological uh, borderlands. So here is Javier, Peñaranda, uh, who says the, the following. He says about the before the map was very dark and he's referring to the state maps of the Periha. The map only said Periha, it didn't exist. It didn't exist, you know, we didn't exist, but now it's all here. Now everyone will know that we live in the Sierra de Periha. So, so you know, what, is, what Javier is doing here is he's clearly articulating the erasure of indigenous land and indigenous practices that is, has been in, intrinsic to the frontier making on the part of the colonial and the Venezuelan state. And it demonstrates how marginalization has been affected through state cartography. So he's using the metaphor of darkness to refer of the invisibilization as such a central technique of cartography and frontier making. But he is at the same time, he is articulating uh, the, the possibility of the co-production that's occurring in these epistemological borderlands that were constituted by this mapping project. And this is, this is a quote from Rafael in the Gran Sabana, who says the following, he says, you young people don't know anything. He says, he's speaking to the, to the community and to a number of young people gathered. He says, you don't know anything you because those you know are we the grandfathers, but you don't. This is because the grandfathers have been moving back and forth from one place to the next. Because of this, we know everything up to the corners. After we do all this, all who come after us will know. We'll see all the places, the rivers, the hills. We need to put down everything because in the future, if we leave spaces open, people might take them from us. 
So, um, so what he's doing here, I would say, is is similarly to Javier is saying is he's, he's suggesting a map or a tool to bring visibility, and I should say very much in, on their own terms to the Pemon production of space. But he also articulates two other points that I think are important. One, one is the understanding that the frontiers are material. Right? This landscape is material. It's produced and understood through the body, through the movement of the grandfathers. And he articulates a very important hypothesis in this, in this statement that, that empty spaces on the state map must be filled in for these maps to do their, do their work okay, in, their, in their territorial claims. So, he, so, so I would say maybe one way of thinking about this through the borderlands concept is that that the borderlands is constituted by this mapping project prompts Rafael to give voice to his agency in a way that constitutes a call for action. So <clears throat> briefly, Dominican Republic. Uh, this is, a, as I mentioned, it's an informal community uh, known as Los Platanitos, uh, located in Santo Domingo Norte, the municipality of Santo Domingo Norte, in the metropolitan area of Santo Domingo. And it's a community uh, that was uh, founded uh, in the 1990s on top of a landfill um, in a very steep canyon and has grown into a community of about 2,000 people and um, not, no time to go into a great detail about the material practices here, but wanted to focus on uh, one element of, of, of of uh, community life here that has to do with uh, the plant production in the community. And it's, um, it, it's a form of, of plant production in this community takes many very different forms and is characterized by very creative uses of space, materials, and it's intrinsic to, to um, good security and to, and to public health and for medicine medicinal uses. So what we've been doing over, over the years has been working with the community as they develop a composting project here. And I'm working with my students over the years. Um, and we have seen the formation of a, of a women's group called Mujeres Unidas that uh, is um, managing this amazing space in the community and also sees its expression through murals that signify the, the role of women in this project. So I wanted to just conclude by sharing a few quotes from, from people who were involved in this project who I got to know over the years, right? So Lydia and Ana Julia are talking about the emotional attachments to plant production, right? So Lydia says, I like growing plants because every time I look at a plant, I see the nature of God. And Ana Julia says, I grow plants out of love. So I would say in these testimonies, they are make clear that the plants are material markers of these urban, urban margins that where Los Patentes find itself. But they're, but they're also embracing the relationship with the material landscape and, 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 and placing it as a different than, this, than the residents in, in the area, what they call the area above the formal or developed city, which is characterized by hard, hardness by concrete and other hard surfaces. Santa says playfully and that she, you need to sing to the words. And that is also laying claim to another form of production in the community. And Alicia concludes by saying, after the project with the worms, we get together more. We look for new options for taking care of the community. We, the women, are prepared for this. So she is articulating the, how this new space has, has produced this compost, composting site and the new social organization leads to this vision for a new form of economic production in the community. And that again is taking place in the epistemological borderlands. So thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about the frontier. Hope I didn't go over time. And uh, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Bjorn. No, that was uh, this perfectly on time. Uh, so our final panelist for this session is Cheryl Ann Simpson. Cheryl Ann. Hi everyone. 
Um, wow. Um, I, being the headliner for today just feels like a bit much, frankly, but I'm honored to be the headliner for the day. Um, I also want to say, um, you know, I think obviously a huge thank you as well to the organizers. Um, I think like everyone else, I, it's sort of amazing in some ways that we can all kind of be together in this way. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that being together in this way is part of a different global event. Um, that's a little bit less amazing and a little bit less great. And I'll also just be honest that as part of that other global event, I'm, I'm just exhausted right now, even though it's been lovely learning from everyone today. Um, and I'm exhausted, you know, from over a year of kind of constant worry and panic about uh, all the folks that I care about. I'm exhausted from the sort of sudden visibility of blackness everywhere um, and all of the new expertise that's popped up around the topic and all of the ways that people want to share about the topic all the time. I'm exhausted from constant work and um, I'm also exhausted from thinking about all of the mourning that's been done in this past year and all the mourning that's been done alone in this past year. But having said that, I also recognize that I am in a better place than a lot of people, in a better place than most maybe. And probably a lot of us are in a better place than most, especially for those of us that work in academia. We have been able to continue our work for the most part at a distance. And now a lot of us actually find ourselves on the sort of fast track list for vaccination on top of everything else. So what I wanna do before I get started is to hopefully. Yeah, okay. It's just to share a list of organizations, um, coalitions, groups, and um, cooperatives and collaboratives that are doing the hard work, even in the pandemic, that I just kind of talk and theorize about. So if you're paid more than a living wage and your income hasn't been impacted by the pandemic, or if you're independently wealthy, I want to encourage you to get out your wallets, and to make an investment in one of these organizations or to a group in your community that's doing similar work. And I mean this for real, right now, not a joke, not a metaphor, not sort of like a, a provocation, really go get your purse, go get your wallet, go get your pocketbook, your credit card, your phone, and send one of these organizations or another organization some money. And then go ahead and put that donation in the chat or in the Q&A um, and tell us what the org is or the orgs or tell us what the orgs and how much it is, whatever you feel comfortable with. But, um, but for real, like actually go do this. This is being recorded. You're not gonna miss anything when you go get your wallet or when you, um, you know, as you're going to get your wallet or as you're looking up donation pages, you're not gonna miss anything. This is being recorded. Okay, so while you're doing that, and again, for real, you're on your computer, you're at home, you can do this right now. I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about um, planning and frontiers. So there are two things that come to mind when I think of um, the frontier. And the first one, Okay. Um, so there's two things that I think of when I think about the frontier. And one of the first ones is as the edge of empire, or maybe even really as like the vanguard of empire. It's this place that's celebrated in its role um, in dispossession and in the imposition of another rule of law on a landscape with its own law, its own inagunagewanan, or a certain way of acting or acting on, as I've been learning from Ami Kraft's work. And it's important to remember that frontiers aren't static or landscapes of the past. Instead, they're cyclically emplacing an ideal of constant growth through extraction and following Deborah McGregor and Laura Polito taking. And that growth, that taking, that extraction needs to be constantly fed. I just finished teaching uh, Richard Van Kemp's Wendigo War Stories. And uh, in an interview, he describes the Wendigo as, quote, a being that is always starving, 
The more it eats, the hungrier it becomes, and the more it drinks, the thirstier it becomes. And I kind of wonder if frontiers are a bit of a windigo. And also the structures that help to produce and reproduce the frontier are also constantly being reinvented from exclusionary zoning to Negro removal, suburban development, immigration policies, ongoing cycles of indigenous land dis dispossession, um, smart cities, investment in the police at the same time as disinvestment in acts of care. All of these are attempts to nourish and satiate frontiers, frontiers which are always hungry and always thirsty. So the second thing that comes to mind is um, Gloria Anzaldúa's marvelous Borderlands La Frontera, the new mestiza. And she defines the borderland by saying that, it, that quote, borders are set up to define the places that are safe and unsafe to distinguish us from them. A borderland is a divided line, a narrow strip along a steep edge. A borderland is a vague and undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. It's a constant state of transition. The prohibited and the forbidden are its inhabitants. And then talking about the idea of dwelling in the borderland, she describes, quote, it's not a comfortable territory to live in. This place of contradictions, hatred, anger, and exploitation are the prominent features of this landscape. However, there have been compensations, she says, certain joys. Living on the borders and in the margins, keeping intact one's shifting and multiple identities and integrity is like trying to swim in a new element, an alien element. There's an exhilaration in being a participant in the further evolution of humankind. And yes, the alien element has become familiar, she says. Never comfortable? Not with society's clamor to uphold the old, to rejoin the flock, to go with the herd. No, not comfortable, but home. So the borderland as an open wound, a space of conflict, and also language, music, movies, food, desire of the neither here nor there is a step towards living sin frontiera without borders. So working for justice in and through planning is, I think, a bit like living in the borderlands. It means continuing to riff off of Anzaldúa, knowing that you're not a community member, that planning will see your claims for justice as a betrayal, and that you can't deny your membership in an institution, in the institution of frontier planning. But there are joys to living sin fronteras to living as a crossroads. So outside of planning practices specifically, I've discussed similar generative, not quite here or there spatial practices as um, liminal citizenship practices. And I think we can also draw sort of more broadly in thinking about scholarship and research. Um, we can draw on folks like um, Stuart Hall and his engagement with ideas around the dialectic, encoding and decoding. And we can also think about Victoria Lawson's work around care in research that claims to be radical. So I think those are some other ideas that kind of blend with this idea of um, the borderland and the idea of sort of sticking with the not quite here-ness, not quite here or there-ness of the borderland. Okay. So what does this all mean in terms of my own research practice and also my engagement with quote, collective decision-making, a fabulous definition of planning that I recently heard um, Nisha Batwe give a little bit ago. So for me, first, a refusal, an idea that I've learned the most about in the context of planning from Heather Dorius's work, a refusal to fuel the cottage industry of report after report after report after report after report, aiming to prove the harm that folks being harmed have already identified and explained to us. So to take an example, the idea of using GIS and spatial analysis and environmental health studies, where the limitations of our tools mean that we often can't actually register what communities are experiencing. 
but where our data is used to disprove community knowledge and to fuel one more study, fuel one more committee, fuel one more panel. And also taking a cue from the Third World Women's Alliance and their idea of triple jeopardy um, and Red Nation and their Red Deal, moving away from initiatives for quote unquote um, inclusion, diversity or reconciliation that don't explic explicitly address taking, perpetual growth and extraction, that don't address the need for redistribution and a decommodification of resources, including land, or that are explicitly or implicitly grounded in a divide and conquer narrative. For example, walking away anytime someone uses the phrase, we don't wanna get involved in the politics of when talking about a development deal or anytime anyone uses a phrase, but we have to be objective talking about anything that has to do with planning. And instead, investing whatever resources I have in understanding the structures that maintain harm and impede or obfuscate actions of care, transformation, thriving, and liberation. For example, unpicking narratives of citizenship and belonging that functionally exclude the communities and importantly, the imaginaries of the communities that are most impacted by collective decision-making or that disrupt the strength and functioning of counter institutions to borrow in a distorted way from Michael Warner. And also teaching justice with joy. So a refusal of the narrative that the harms caused by others are the defining characteristics of our communities. And always keeping in mind that students from our communities don't travel the road of education alone for better or for worse. And thinking as a crossroads, um, Supporting, incorporating, and amplifying the work, organizing, theorizing, language, imaginaries, and narratives of groups, organizations, and institutions producing in real ways, both their own and, our, and all of our liberation and thriving. In the editorial for the special edition titled Planning Beyond Mass Incarceration that I co-edited with Justin Steele and Aditi Mehta, we talk about the real as being bodily, spiritual, and material. And so since the work I want to support is real, my support has to be as well, including importantly, always asking who am I working for, who am I working with, and importantly, who is my work accountable to? And so thinking about the real accountability and specifically materiality and redistribution, even in the smallest way, one more time, um, send those coins along and let us know about it as well. So right now, that's how I would describe the borderland where I'm finding home. And I'll go ahead and just leave off with um, all the shout outs that I mentioned during the, this quick talk. Thanks so much. Thank you, Cheryl Ann. Indeed, I think a perfect keynote. <laughs> headliner, headliner. <laughs> headliner, that's <laughs> it. So um, again, thank you to all the panelists. Bjorn had to leave, uh, so he's not here with us anymore. And we have a few minutes for discussion. There are a couple of questions in the Q&A, but I would like to just start and offer uh, some time for any of the panelists on this panel to respond to each other. There were some provocations made, assertions, and, and just, you know, in, really compelling stories. And uh, yeah, would anyone like to, to comment? Ken, I feel like you have something that you're thinking about. I mean, <laughs> of course I have something like a back pocket thing, but like, <laughs> okay. So, but feel free, like, I think part of it is to, to encourage some interaction here. Like one of the things I was thinking, and, and really this is in observing and learning from so many of the panelists across the day today, that, you know, on the one hand, like we, so many of us, I think are, we, we want to insist on the importance of difference and to highlight and learn from particularities. And we're 
in many ways, not to say all generally speaking, but, but, but many of us are distrustful of grand theories. And yet, in so many of the presentations, I see a kind of like um, parallel look at how these particularities do, uh, they, they may not travel, but they may be observable in very parallel formats in other places. So in each place, we look for these ground up making of collectivities. We look for the transversalities, the kinds of, um, uh, like building alternate spatial imaginaries from different positional places. And I'm wondering in some ways, like we might say like no to the grand theories, but are we in some ways creating a, a new mode of grand theorizing uh, in, in that, that, you know, if I were being like a, a, a grand theorist, I might, I might make some parallel categories and say like, we, we're seeing a lot of the same, the same conflicts, the same, the same, um, the same, remapping, the same attempts at remapping, the same, some, some scholars who are taking very similar strategies in order to unearth those kinds of conflicts and contestations. Is that part of a new grand theorizing? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'll, I'll start perhaps, um, Kian, and, and I can see where you're going with that question. And I think you're Suggesting, I mean, sort of like the panelists did before, is that when um, you know there are terminologies that we seek to stretch and apply across uh, contexts. Um, I think the word that Vanessa Watson used uh, earlier in the day was leapfrogging. Right. So, what are the dangers in that? Um, it, it, do we then succumb to a kind of flattening, right, without looking at the the key place-based differences? Um, and I can see where you're going with that question, but I think the, sp the speakers on this panel and throughout the day have really spoken to, you know, what it means to pay attention to particular idioms that 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 you hear and and that are in use and that have political traction. But also the question Cheryl Ann was asking at the end, you know, who are we accountable to, right? And 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 who are working with? And so, and if we keep that question at the forefront of our research agendas, um, that that I think you know so. So many of the speakers kind of spoke to today, who are we accountable to and who are we working with, right? Then, then that flattening cannot, is prevented from happening because, you know, we, we, have, to, we have to truth seek and we have to, to, to honor, you know, the particular nuances and commitments that, 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 um, that, are, that are in circulation. And so, so I would say, I guess my short answer to your question is, is, is I don't think that there were pushing for another grand theory in these new liberatory idioms or these liberatory um, um, you know, frames that we're proposing um, precisely if, I would say, if and when we are accountable to. Thank you. Yeah, and I just, um, I, I just jump in to say, uh, and thanks Mamini, uh, that I'm not so troubled by, uh, I mean, I, I don't, share your caution so much about grand theory if it's examined in a relational way, right? Which is, I hope what we've been doing here all day, but that you take, um, you take um, knowledge, uh, di differently situated knowledge uh, as a basis for rethinking issues of global concern or, you know, traveling um, ideas and concepts like capitalism and patriarchy. So, I mean, I think the, the, the goal from my point of view is to continually refine, trouble, develop grand narratives in relation to context specific um, experience and knowledge, right? And and that planning is well situated to do that. Thank you. So I think I will bring up a couple of the questions that are in the Q&A now. Uh, one, which is by Mar Maria Teresa Vasquez Castillo, who is restating a question from the morning, but it, it, it um, is quite relevant to this one. Can, can you elaborate 
on the impacts of the new waves of displacement and dispossessions in the global south that are taking place due to climate change and new global criminal activities, which in turn are reformulating the global distribution of space and land, both rural and urban, and posing new planning challenges and ways of recolonization and not decolonization. And I think if I, if I, if I would call on anyone, I would call on Malini here. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Maria, so much for your question. Um, and, and Kian, perhaps you would like to weigh in actually on this question as well. Um, but um, you know, you you point out a really important trend, um, which is that not just is you know the physicality of climate change is we're seeing the really you know dire rising seas uh, interacting with embedded and historically. Um, constructed vulnerabilities, right, leading to displacement, um, you know, and, and entire islands, of course, being uprooted, um, but also the ways in which climate change resilience discourse is being deployed um, in the service, and this is what I was trying to get at, at the iterative relationship between environmental unfreedoms, you know, and, and dispossessions, and environmental logics are often used, you know, to perpetuate or to legitimize Right, to legitimize these um, projects of slum removal. And you see them happening perhaps most starkly in places like um, the Philippines, right? So um, they're, they're very, very prone to uh, monsoonal flooding, right? Because of the archipelago, um, you know, South Pacific location. And, um, and, and when, when those happen and then there's flooding, right? The next thing that happens, the state comes in and will clear out all the slums uh, on the Pasig River. Um, and so there's this kind of um, real sort of climate urbanism as, as, as some of my, my friends in the political ecology work call it, that um, you know, is, 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 is quite um, uh, brutal and extreme in, in the ways it responds. And so I, I absolutely would agree to you, with you that this is something that um, as political ecologists, we have to be attentive to. Thank you, Malini. And, and I'll just add, yeah, in, in the sites that I see, I see that I work in, I see very much the same dynamics that Maria is talking about here. And it brings to mind that we need to, to pay attention to what Cheryl Ann was saying, that, you know, to, to refuse when we have, you know, invocations of things like climate threats and such uh, being posed as a, a, a necessary reason to put in place particular plans and to deny politics or say, no, let's not bring the politics in. We have sea level rise projections, for instance. Uh, so that's, uh, again, I think just centers that need to, to, to maintain, uh, maintain that kind of uh, view of the world. And I will move to, so there's a question by Peter Marcuse. And so this, I believe it was brought up during Nima's talk when you talked about drawing and with, with plans and, and like planning diagrams. I, I'm not sure if any one of you well, is working on this, but I think it's an interesting question. Is there any attention being paid to the function of drawing possibly the most important boundaries uh, in the US today around the congressional districts for the next 10 years. Uh, and and uh, Peter states that, you know, these lines are being redrawn, not with any particularly uh, well-formed planning view of the world, even with its dark side sides considered, but really on a focus on, on, on political affiliations. I don't have an answer for Peter um, because I don't know who's doing the redrawing of political boundaries in America with gerrymandering. It would seem that it's a, like you know it's it's a decision that takes place in a, in a, um, in a forum that perhaps planners aren't even part of. Um, but I don't know anything about it, Peter, so I can't respond. Um, what I do think that's interesting that your question raises for me is. Um, how salient planning even is it in any of these conversations? It came up in one of the morning's convers, you know, uh, one of the questions in the morning. We, of course, as planners, think we're quite at the center of so many of these conversations. But, um, you know, at, 
I'm not so sure we are. Um, and if you work in India, as I do, or Malini does, we're not. And if you look at the numbers of planners that get generated out of, you know, Indian schools and what they're doing, um, or what happens with and who does these plans, it, it, it's it's we're not in the conversation. We're not at the center of it. We're not anywhere in it most of the time. And so I think that's a real issue, right, to think about. And so do we then? So I think there's one one really important realm of of um, scholarship, which is what Malini pointed out. And as many of us do, is to study the outcomes of this lack of planning or whatever form of planning we have. And then there's the other way we sort of, you know, there's many other realms, of course, but, you know, some of us study this, the planning or the lack thereof itself, like Sharon Land pointed out. And so I do think, I do think um, there are many questions that maybe we attack academically, which in practice planners have no finger in. And I think that discrepancy to me is something that's really important for us to take on um, and really understand. So I'll stop there. So maybe I can take that. Oh, oh, Catherine, did you have something? I did, but if you wanna uh, continue with your thought, that's also fine. Well, I think I think this may this is just very much in line with it. So Scott Campbell has a, a, some comments and a question. So. Uh, Today's speakers, I imagine like beyond this panel, they speak of an ambitious, creative, expansive set of ideas and political transformations. Social theory, social movements, and our imaginations may know few boundaries, but the professionally oriented discipline of planning may have real constraints that limit this work within our professional boundaries. How much of this transformative post-colonial work can happen within planning? And how much do we need to promote outside of planning? Oh, wait, I just lost a question. Okay, how much do we need to promote outside the confines of planning? There may be inherent limits to the ability of urban planning to be the most effective arena to promote this work. Catherine. So yeah, that actually connects well to the, the previous question by Peter. Um, the answer to which I'm also mostly ignorant of, but it did remind me that um, in the connection that we I'm having with the on you know the provincial planning um, uh, institute that registers planning programs and individual planners, one of the um, one of these such such an encouraging development um, in this moment that that I'm seeing with them is that they are genuinely taking another look at what they call the competencies or planning practice against which both planning programs are evaluated and individual planner planners have to you know demonstrate their competencies. And it occurred to us as we were talking about our own program and trying to think about, you know, trying to stretch beyond these guild-based competencies that I think Scott's question is also, you know, um, rooted in or, or reminding us of, that um, there's a bunch of kinds of actions that I think we as planning educators would like to claim as planning competencies, like political organizing, right? You need to organize politically to change those jurisdictional boundaries or to, to refuse the changes that are being um, promoted in, I guess it's Georgia, right? Um, Georgia and Alabama, I'm not sure. But anyways, so what are the um, planning, like the social planning skills that are rooted in and there's another question by Tom and Gotti about community engagement, right? That are recruiting, rooted in specifying um, what are the needed sort of social justice oriented organizing and um, popular education kind of oriented skills that planners need in order to be effective, Nima, in the kinds of debates that maybe planning is marginalized from because of that 
you know, that blind sight, that, what do you call it? Blind spot in, a, in competencies. Does that make sense? So I, I would just say two things quickly. I think the first thing is that like, um, I mean, planning as a, as a formal field is about a hundred years old. It's not very old. And so the idea that there is like this long tradition of what planning is and how it has to be done, um, it just, it's not really factually true, right? What planning has been and what planners have done has changed a great deal in that hundred years as well. And so I think that idea of like limiting our imaginations and our imaginaries in terms of like what practicing public planners can and can't do, um, it's, um, it makes sense, right? Because we are constrained in the systems that we're in, but it's also kind of like, it's a bit of a cop out in another way. I think the other thing is, you know, reflecting on, you know, both Nima and, and Catherine's ideas around sort of planning as pedagogy. I've actually never taught in a planning program. I, you know, right now I'm teaching undergrads in environmental studies and a little bit in geography. And so, you know, I, I do teach a planning class in that context, but my, my assumption is not that most of these people are going to become professional public planners or consultants, but they're going to become elite citizens because all of us teach people that are going to become elite citizens. And so for me, right, that question around uh, you know, gerrymandering, for example, what, are our elite, what do our elite citizens know about how their own systems work, right, how their own political systems work, how their own systems of, um, again, you know, thinking about what the way that Nisha defines planning as collaborative decision-making. What do they know about how the systems of collaborative decision-making work? What do they know um, about the land that they're standing on, right? Like, so again, like that idea of planning as pedagogy, I think that both Catherine and Nima brought up feels really important um, in the context of these questions. Thank you. And so I, I want to leave uh, like some minutes at the end for closing comments. So I'll just air two related questions and maybe take one answer. Uh, the first by Ana Maria Leon, uh, who says that, quote, I've seen change specific to curriculum. This is actually quite related to the, the current conversation. I've seen change stopped in different ways. For instance, with arguments for faculty independence, in quotes, excellence, in quotes, we don't see color, and even a kind of, you know, like misled mobilization of intersectionality, quotes, my course addresses class, so I don't need to address race. Do you have any strategies or advice to circumvent or resist these racist arguments against change in institutional settings? So that's the first question. And then the second one, which is by uh, Shafali Lakina. So, uh, who has been reflecting on Sarah Ahmed's critical reading of institutionalized diversity. Ahmed shows us how the institutionalization of diversity can lead to inclu inclusion and complaint as token, but seldom leads to equity and transformation. So open question, how can we approach diversity as ethic, method, and outcome? And I think we'll, we'll have one response to that. Catherine, are you going? You want me to go? One person can. Well, if, if both of Nima, go ahead and then Catherine. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so Shifali, thank you for that. I do think Sarah Emmett's work's really um, you know, quite quite central, right, to thinking through some of these questions. And I think the danger of tokenism is very real. I mean, Cheryl Ann sort of, you know, called us on it, right? Um, so thank you for that, Cheryl Ann. And, and I think that's, you know, the, the tokenism piece is very, very real. And so the struggle always becomes, in my mind, is to design these institutions, or our institutions, the practices within our institutions, such that they remain unsettled. And that's the challenge, right? How do you embed a piece? Uh, how do you how do you how do you design a practice such that every time you make a decision, you have to actually think, as opposed to just sliding into um, a mode of just doing it without thinking, right? And so I think I think that's um, that's the 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 method piece is to force the thinking. And if you if we consistently force the thinking and we think about this, you know, the part that that both Catherine and I have been talking about is planning as pedagogy, and the institution itself embraces that kind of thinking, 
maybe we'll have some shifts and some changes. So I think that's one answer. Um, but thank you for that. And then Anna Maria, you know, the way the American Academy is constructed, the 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 content of a course is is not subject to anybody's anybody's touch unless the course is owned by the faculty and so I think one of the shifts that we've been starting to make um, is to talk about how the core does not belong to one faculty member that the core belongs to a group of faculty and if it belongs to the group then that group has to be having a conversation so again unsettle that question of who things belong to um, and if they belong to some, you know, a group that's larger than whatever that disciplinary canon wants to define, I think it opens up the question of the curriculum. So I'll just stop there. Catherine. Well, just to agree with Nima, I, I was going to say almost the same thing and, and her talk actually um, made the same point. I would just add that um, the core belongs to the faculty and must be um, held accountable yeah. to a collective mission, right? And she talked, she talked, she chronicled that production of that collective mission. So um, that I think that's the recipe <laughs> that kind of takes those arguments um, because of the mandate for accountability to a collective mission. Then those arguments are, you know, really dissipate and. Um, I find that colleagues when, and what we've done actually at U of T is to, I like the way you say that, you know, whose property is the course and also the course has a responsibility to articulate how it relates to the mission. So then, you know, everything is framed in relation to this collective articulation and, uh, but but you know the Kathy that that kind of formulation and I mean I'm listening to Sherlan who said um, I don't know Sherlan I'd be interested to hear what you think about this you know is there accountability um, if if we convert sort of the ownership of the core to a kind of a collective right does that does that accountability then change the relationship of those who held a certain kind of expertise from their interests, from their studies, or does it do this displacement function that you were so critical of? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two ways to think about it. I think I think the idea of, you know, of the faculty owning the core, um, I think it works when the faculty is all accountable in a similar way. So if there is an agreement, right, if there has been the work that's been done, the relationships that's, that have been built, I think then even that the conflict over that maybe becomes a little bit lessened. I think the, uh, trying to think how to say this. I think the flip side though, is exactly what you pointed out, Nima, that like, um, again, right, this, this sort of idea of borderlands, right? That there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's contestation, mm -hmm. but there's also opportunity. So yeah. I was nodding along when you said that there's nobody checking your syllabus because there's nobody checking your syllabus. And so if there isn't that, that same accountability across the faculty, I'm, I'm not, a, like the faculty is not my first, my first port of accountability. So, you know, my syllabus, my syllabus does things that my colleagues would not do <laughs> true but if you want the core to do stuff yeah you have but I, you to know but here's that. but here's how i do that i i teach uh i teach core classes and i like i volunteered to teach core classes that nobody else wants to teach <laughs> and you know but i'm quite happy to teach them because it means that every student that comes through our program um, has now been affected by the the whims of my right. own accountabilities. But Cheryl Ann, then it's not. I'm not saying it's an endpoint. Yeah, it's not a good. It's not, an end point. not a good I'm not strategy. It's an end point. Yeah, because then you land up doing a lot of work. Well, but again, right? I get, but there there's choice, and there's so much choice in the work there that is we some. do. Right. So yeah, I don't have. I mean, so I teach a core class, but that also means I don't have to do any grading because I got six TAs. Boom. Right. So you know, I mean, there's there's so much there's choice in terms of what that work is. Right. So true. true. All right, Malini. 
this question that Anna Maria asked clearly has touched a nerve um, because you know I'm also in the thick of it. I teach in an international affairs school. Mm. The hegemonic epistemology is post-Cold War Eurocentric international relations, right? And 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 faculty, white male faculty had the audacity to say things like, why does race and anti-racism matter? To the can, I mean, to the canon, completely erasing the history of Black internationalism, you know, in the mm -hmm. founding of, of of the one of the major journals, international relations. So it's, it's incredibly white and disciplined. But here are my quick pieces of advice. So I love what Cheryl Ann said about teaching core classes. Absolutely, teach classes that maximum students flock to, right? Um, which is what I do, and I and I teach it in that insurgent way, you know, against the canon, but but you know, also helping them in this process of unlearning. I think unlearning is as important as learning, and I've often said that. The second is don't wait till tenure. People tell you wait till tenure, keep your head down. It's total bullshit, right? And I've learned this from <laughs> inventors. Don't wait to tenure because you're not going to be you're going to be politically spineless before tenure. You're also going to be that after tenure. Third, coalition and alliance building is. Oh my god, this is amazing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, I think people know, you know, like know this kind of advice, they get, they get it, right? Um, coalition and alliance building is key. We can't bring everyone along. I don't want to bring, I don't want to waste my energy in trying to convince people, you know, I have far better things to do. Um, the university that most of us works in retains a white supremacist core, but we can find allies and we can organize with them. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So can I just add one thing? And I agree with Malini. If you're political now, it you know, having tenure or not having tenure doesn't make any goddamn difference. And so, you know, do what you want to do now. So I totally agree with you, Malini, um, on that question. It is a lot of work, though. And so, you know, be aware of that as well. And so uh, so that's even if you have 60 years, it's still a lot of work. And so I do think thinking about that is important. You know, there's one piece of it. Nima, just one thing, just one thing quickly to say, though, what you're doing is a lot of work as well. And I think exactly what Melanie just pointed yes, out is yes, yes. bringing people along who don't yes. want to bring to me. That's a lot of work and it's work that I don't want to do. So I yeah. so I think Mel, what Melanie yeah. is saying, right, is it's like yeah. it's a diversity of tactics at the end it of the is. day. Right? And I, I've taught in the core from the first day I came to Cornell throughout and I still teach in the core. In, and I do the other stuff. So I mean, so when you have once you have tenure, maybe you can do things a little differently. So um, but that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is something that Tom and Gotti, I think there's some earlier conversation that's been going on. I missed part of the day today um, on community engagement work right and I do want to bring that up because it's not just I mean our core curriculum is is it really critical it's important and there's ways in which our classrooms like you know bell hooks so usefully reminds us are these radical spaces right off of possibility but how we engage with communities and the ethics of our, our research ethics when we start talking about this question of decentering, decolonizing, how we engage, I don't think we're paying enough attention to that. I don't think we're talking enough about it. I don't think we are um, thinking enough about it. And then where does this question of, you know, what Catherine and I are talking about of planning as pedagogy begin to come in, in these conversations of community engagement. And so that's the other really important piece that I don't hear. I mean, you hear the anthropologists talking a lot about it. Right. And I don't hear us talking enough about it. I think some of us do, but not in the ways in which we are culpable. Our institutions are culpable for the sorts of relationships, you know, we, we're working through and working out. And then how we um, really teach that in in planning practice and in workshops, because, of course, you know, formal planning, especially in the United States. I mean, go to California. I can't do a thing without community agreement. Right. And so, so I think that's a piece of it that I'd like to leave us all with in terms of thinking about um, the, uh, that other piece of, of, the, of the pedagogy puzzle. Thank you. I love it. This is just like crazy cool stuff here. Um, so thank you all panelists for taking part. And really this could go on for a bit, but I am going to bring back the fearless conceptualizer and convener for the day, uh, Professor Hibabu Akar. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Oh, I was like behind the, the, <laughs> the screen cheering <laughs> on everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for the fearless panel. Thank you for the fearless thought. Thank you for, for uh, 
igniting the fire um, here for all of us. Uh, thank you for this panel. Thank you for every, for all the speakers who, uh, who spoke today and for the um, moderators. So it has been a, lo a long, wonderful, long Zoom day. And thank you for the 90 something people who are still with us. Uh, I also want to thank all the 20 speakers and uh, the um, moderators uh, for keeping for keeping um, for keeping us uh, on fire today and for like really um, providing a lot of food for thought. Uh, I also want to reiterate uh, my thanks to my co-moderators for um, Kayango, for uh, Dalio and Dal and uh, um, Sai Balakrishnan for actually uh, supporting me on, on this day today and for being amazing. I, I mean, um, our, our little woman in planning uh, group uh, has been like a really uh, amazing support uh, in, the, in the past uh, couple of years. So I'm thankful for today and for the privilege of your friendship and your support and collaborations. Thank you so much. Uh, I also, it has been heart, uh, heartening to see the engaged and wonderful questions and the generative dialogue, dialogue uh, along since 9.30 a.m. Uh, here in uh, New York time. I hope we, we are able to continue these conversations um, in many forms and formats. And my biggest hope is that I'm gonna get to meet all of you in person, hopefully in post-COVID world where, um, where we'll be able to go back and, uh, and actually shake each other's hand and have a drink afterwards and invite all the audience to come with us. Um, I also um, want to thank again, Laila Catelier for her brilliance, for her support. Uh, and I wanna um, thank Mayev uh, who uh, is behind the AV today. And this link, the recording for this event will be up on YouTube for people who weren't able to be here for the day or you wanna, they wanna go to some of the panels. Again, thank you everyone. Thank you speakers. Thank you panelists. Thank you moderators. Thank you audience. And until we meet again, please stay safe and hopefully we'll emerge in a better world soon. Thank you.